But, you know, I think if you're looking for drama in a novel, that the less certainty you have, the better. The, the more the character wavers or is in between. And you have a moment in the book where someone says um, to Edith Somerville, um, strikes me you're between the devil and the deep blue sea, if you'll pardon me for saying it. Not Irish enough in Ireland, not Britisher enough in England. And, um, but that she, in Ireland during this period, it's not as though she wants to join the rebels. That would be a different sort of book. It's not as though she's pure unionist. That would be another sort of book. It is that she's caught in between the two, that she's both Irish and loyal to something else. That she's, that, that in a way her allegiances are gnarled and strange and they more or less are to a house and the history of a house and the atmosphere in a house, but also in a stranger way to the community around the house, to the, to the sort of atmosphere. So that she's caught in a trap in a way, because this is a time when loyalties are dividing, when people's loyalties are becoming more and more clear, and hers are becoming in a way less and less clear. So, so, so I wonder if you could start by, by letting, to telling us how you saw her character. Oh, I think it's also important that it's the aftermath of this great collaboration she has done with Violet Martin, so that in a way she's alone. And, and again, we're talking about lack of certainty, where Violet Martin is both absent and present. So, so I just wonder if you could start by describing to us how this character came into your mind, how you both researched her and imagined her. Mm. Thank you, Colm. And first of all, before I answer that, can I thank Colm Tobin, who's a star in the Irish firmament for scattering a little bit of his stardust on other writers, oh which is what he's doing. With Get on, answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> he's embarrassed, he's embarrassed. Um, well, come on, I'm a northerner. We don't plumoss easily. Um, Edith is hybrid, as you've said, and that hybridity is what drew me to her. I was very struck by how in the early 1920s, she wrote a letter to one of her brothers, scolding him for saying he was English. She said, we're Irish or we're British if you must, but we're not English. She saw a difference. And it was one of those pinch me moments for me in the archive. I thought to myself, here's a woman who only had one year at school, Alexandra College in Dublin, and had governesses other than that, who came up with the idea of hybridity as an important asset at a time when people said, choose, which are you, what are you, we want you to be pure, whatever. She made a case for hybridity. And it took decades and decades after that for it to be enshrined in the Good Friday Agreement. Um, now, Darwin saw what he saw as the importance of hybrid vigour, and I don't know if there are any gardeners in the room, but if there are, hybridity is very important there. So Edith Somerville spotted this and said, you know what, it's a good thing. And I was very struck by that. I was struck by when I was trying to imagine myself into her shoes, the way she was similar to Violet Martin or Martin Ross, her co-author, and the ways that she was different to her. And as Colm says, her loyalty was in the first instance to a house. And I thought that this was perhaps not unusual among her cast. It was the house, and the house was an icon. And then after the house, there was the land that was owned. And it was a slow process in some cases, not in all, for uh, people who lived there then to identify with the broader mass of people. And Edith did over time. But she was no Countess Markievicz. You know, she wasn't going to spend all her money um, for Irish culture and Irish freedom. She was quite suspicious of the, um, the program that Lady Gregory and W.B. Yeats were running at the Abbey. The, the Celtic twilighting and so forth. You know, they, she and Martin 
snuffled and sniggered a bit at that. But Edith was, had a very strong sense of her Irish identity, and I felt that this needed to be examined and attention needed to be paid to it. Um, and so that's what drew me into the novel. The, there's a problem, isn't there, in reading her, um, where I think the Irish RM stories are silly. I don't, I don't know if you agree with me about that. Do, do you agree with me about that? Well, I do and I don't. Um, I think they're clever. I think they use humour, which is still hard enough for women to be taken seriously for, you know, as exponents of humour. Uh, they uh, reflected the way the country people spoke quite um, truthfully, in a way that perhaps Lady Gregory's, the Kiltartanese, was perhaps, uh, you know, people laughed at that. But, but the dialogue in the Irish RM stories, you can hear local people saying it. Um, and I could see in their notebooks phrases that they'd noted down from court cases or from walking down the village. I could see them then as dialogue in the stories. So there was a truthfulness in that. Right. Okay? I, I mean, I raise that because I think the other books, um, and I, I, I think it's unique, I can't think of another example where two people, let alone two women, collaborated in producing a number of masterpieces, because I think The Real Charlotte, Silver Fox, Big House of Inver, are absolutely marvellous books, and, and they're underappreciated. They um, are. I mean, Charlotte, me is, Charlotte is probably appreciated, but you're right, Inver isn't, and the Silver Fox, you've picked out two, uh, you'd think he'd study this, wouldn't you? It's extraordinary. You've picked out two of the other really excellent ones. And Inver in particular, of course, was by Edith alone. It wasn't by Somerville and Ross, the dual signature. And, and again, this was very interesting to me as well, the fact that Violet Martin or Martin Ross, she called her Martin, so just so you're not confused when I say Martin, that's who I mean. Um, Violet Martin died in December 1915 and Edith wondered could she write again at all because she was so accustomed to the dual signature and she came up with quite an inventive way of persuading herself that they were continuing to collaborate, we might talk about that later, but the big house of Inver I would think is very nearly on a par with the real Charlotte. It deals with illegitimacy, which is really unusual, illegitimacy in the big house. It deals with miscegenation, this fear about people marrying or breeding across class lines. And um, uh, it's, it's really quite courageous. It's dramatic. A lot of their work is, very, is cinematic, and it's odd that more hasn't been made cinematically of it. Edith, uh, just going off at a tangent, did do a film treatment of their first <coughs> novel, um, An Irish Cousin, and I've read the film script, I found it in the archive, mislabeled as a play, and I found it and looked at it and I thought, this is a film script, and then I went and read notes and saw that she had been interested in cinema as well. What year is this? So this was, uh, no, it was maybe, it was the early years of cinema. I think it was the late 20s or early 30s. It was very early. It was a silent movie, yeah. you know, so there were like uh, images and then legends, you know, mm. but um, it, it would make a, a very interesting film. When they collaborated, how did this happen? Could you just give us an, an, an idea of... You know, did, did they meet regularly? Did, did they correspond? How, how did that work? They didn't meet as often as people think. They didn't live together until about 1906 after Martin's mother died. And until then, sometimes they took holidays together and worked on a book. That's where the Irish RM was first born. They were on holiday in Normandy and it was wet and their agent was mithering them for uh, copy. Uh, he'd sold the uh, the idea of these stories, but they just didn't get around to doing them. And uh, it's a rainy day, and they sit and they talk, flurry knocks and major yates and slipper into life. Uh, but generally, it was by letter, and manuscripts would go backwards and forwards, which is great because you can see amendments down the side, and in Edith's case, doodles. She was also a very talented artist. Uh, later in life, she had two 
exhibitions, one in London and one in New York, which sold out. And of course, she illustrated all their work. So if you have an early edition of any of these books Colm has mentioned, including the Irish RM collections of stories, there were three of them. You know, the drawings in them of Fleury and so on come straight from in here. I think that's so unusual because readers have their own idea of what a character looks like. But when we see Edith's illustrations, we see exactly how she envisaged them. So yeah, it was backwards and forwards. The postal system was very good. And they struggled to identify themselves quite how they collaborated on this dual signature. Sometimes I look at it and I'll think, well, Edith was an artist and she had a very good eye for colour, so the, there's a descriptive passage using specific artists' words for colour. It's probably a safe bet that Edith was involved with that. Uh, but you're guessing, of course you are. Uh, Martin was more intellectual than Edith, and it seems to me that she probably edited uh, more carefully than Edith did. Edith would appear to be quite a humorous person, I'm guessing from the letters, lots and lots of letters and their turns of phrase, but it just appeared to be the dynamism uh, between the two. I, I guess for each of the two writers, um, the other one was an electrical charge they could plug into. Mm. And Edith really did worry that she wouldn't be able to write on her own mm. after Martin died. She thought that was it now. She was all washed up. You know, their first book had come out in the late 1880s, 1889, and Martin died in 1915. They'd had a very good run for their money. And then, was it all over now? Which is a very good time to start a novel. And the, um, so I'm talking about ideas of aftermath, but also I was talking at the beginning about uncertainty. So there's an uncertainty in the book, isn't there, that, that is really dramatic, which is, is she or is she not lesbian? And is she going to go to bed with Ethel Smith when she arrives? And <laughs> Ethel Smith, there are two great scenes where, you know, Ethel Smith, first of all, just jumps naked into the lake. You've got a big description of, like, he just sort of watching her, thinking, you know, I'm not going in there. And then the other one, a marvelous one in London, where she's going for a bath, and Ethel announces she'd like to go up and just sit with her. And <laughs> Mabel, her sister-in-law, says, aghast at this idea. But, but there's also, of course, the question of Violet Martin. There's a question of how close were they when, when she's having the seances with her. Are you talking about them as lovers? And if not lovers, as what? And is, is there a constant pressure to say, for you, and I think it's wonderful how you resist it, you know, you're not actually going to move into certainty. You're going to move into, un, you know, into sort of the sort of drama around not knowing. Well, we can't know. We can't know if there were lovers. And especially today, there's a lot of pressure to put women into bed together, um, women from history, whether we know or not. And I thought about it very hard while I was researching the novel, and I was open to it. Um, but I simply couldn't find enough evidence to make them lovers. There was no doubt that they loved each other, that Martin was the most important relationship in Edith's life. She mourned her for the rest of her life. Uh, but is that the same as being a lover or is that someone that you can travel with and have fun with and achieve things with and you're on the same wavelength with? And as well, Women had quite passionate friendships then, we know from letters, and thought nothing of sharing a bed, um, would go about hand in hand or with their arms around each other. It doesn't necessarily mean it was a physical relationship as we don't imagine it today. I just don't know is the short answer, and I felt on balance, probably not. But look, I could be wrong, and somebody else could write a novel, and you know they would be having passionate uh, love every night of the week, and you know that would be equally valid. But for me, it didn't seem to be the relationship. And as well, you know, by the time I opened the novel, she's sixty-three, and it's not that 
all that is beyond you at 63 and you can't anymore. <laughs> it is. It is. <laughs> but I didn't, <laughs> I didn't feel it was important, to, should we say. And then the final, the final thing really was that I thought if they had shared a bed, the locals would have talked about it. There were servants in the house, and there, it, it would have just been known, and there was never a whisper of that among the servants. Whereas, say, with the ladies of Clan Gokin, who we know were lovers in an earlier period, people talked about it. it. It wasn't hidden. So, And then the only other thing is that I know Edith turned... Uh, sorry, was proposed to twice, turned down one but really wanted to marry the other and accepted him. And her parents refused to allow the marriage to go ahead because they were afraid it would have meant her sliding a little down the social scale. And that was one of the cruel aspects of those families um, and that period where they'd prefer their daughters or sisters not to have a home of their own and a family of their own in case that the family somehow uh, was no longer upper class, was you know middle class mm. or worse. Um, I, I've just published a novel about Thomas Mann, and I, you know, been asked these questions, like, is what evidence do you have for something? And I find it really tedious, and I wish people wouldn't. So I'm going to ask. Do you mind if I just take it out on you? Um, um, tell me about the seances. T tell me about her relationship to Violet after death. So um, Edith genuinely believed that she continued to collaborate with Martin after their death through spiritualism, through seances, and through automatic or trance writing. She really believed it, and she did trance writing virtually every night of her life. So just for those of you who don't know what that is, it's you just let your mind go blank, hold your, the pencil very loosely on the page, and just write everything that comes into your mind. And she would ask questions and believe she was getting answers about plot and character. Now, I had a go at that myself to see what it was like. And I got neither plot nor character. I got to-do lists. Um, but it, it, it isn't as bonkers as it sounds today. Um, you have to set it within the period where there was an openness to telepathy and did dreams mean anything? People were open to all of this. They just didn't know. Uh, people like Yeats, uh, his wife used automatic writing and he was very inspired by it. Arthur Conan Doyle, who wrote the Sherlock Holmes stories, was into spiritualism. Why were people into spiritualism at that time? So with Edith, now it's 1916. Ask yourself, what was happening? in the world in 1916, beyond Ireland, because maybe we think of Easter um, and the GPO, but the world was at war, and a whole generation of young men were gobbled up and spat out by the World War I meat grinder. And people struggled with the idea that they would never see their lover, their brother, their next door neighbor again, and spiritualism offered them comfort. And for Edith, there was comfort. But what she was doing was reading those manuscripts and letters, and they'd often sent each other ideas for novels. You know, we have letters in the archive saying, I visited Tyrone House and saw this and that, and wouldn't that make a great novel if we dared to write it? So. Edith was mining all this material. She inherited all Martin's literary archive. She had it all there. She was going through it, remembering conversations and using all that material. And then the other thing is her agent and her publisher really didn't believe her when she insisted on using the dual signature and saying, oh, I'm doing this in collaboration. But... <coughs> They went along with it because it created a mystery, and a mystery is good for business. Um, I want to ask you a sort of technical question. Um, there's, there's, there are a few extraordinary things in the book that are really jumped at me, and I thought, oh, this is, this is, um, this is so good. You could, you could teach this, you know. And the first one has to do with boots. So you think, okay, the, the house is going to be taken over by these guys, and of course the 
everyone is trying to get new shoes because they have, they're moving so much. And he, he realizes this, 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 this kid who's, who may be called Dennis, who's from the stole, and um, that he wants a pair, <coughs> that he wants a pair of shoes. And the shoes, the shoes that are in the house, the boots actually fit him. Means he leaves his old ones behind. His old ones behind, dangerous because they have the name of the cobbler in the stole. That means he can be traced to the stole. That means the cobbler can actually be found. That means his family can be found. So those shoes become a thing. And then, of course, later on, you get the shoes again, and you get an encounter in London, but you get a further um, use of the shoes, where, where in fact the you know the new shoes he has becomes a way of misidentifying. So the shoes move, I think it's four times, and it's also in a really important moment. <laughs> but the, the golden rule in this world is not to inform. And the big house is being watched all the time. Are you informing? And you can see it in, for example, Lady Gregory is constantly worried. Does anyone think she's, in, she's dealing with the police in any way? Even when her daughter-in-law is involved in it, when, when, when there's a sort of IRA shooting, she doesn't want Margaret, her daughter-in-law, to be seen going into a police station to give evidence in Galway because she'll be watched. And people will think she's fingering people. And the whole point's not to do this because you don't want your house to be burned. And so the, the, if, there's a, you know, if there's a big moment in the novel where a decision is made not to tell the police about the shoes, but then in London, later on, when she sees her nemesis, in a way, the guy who killed her dog, she makes the wrong decision. And, and in a way, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's that moment where she, if there's a sort of, it's not exactly a fatal flaw, but it's a moment where you realize she has pushed her luck very far. So I suppose the, this is, I promise, coming to a question. Um, in drafting the novel, just, just, just give us the shoes, for example. Does that come first? Like, when do you realize you can use it four times? When do you realize this, this can be a sort of theme, a motif through the book? Or does it come immediately when you're planning, when you're writing the first draft, when you're going back over it? Like, what point does this shoe business? Happen? I'm not a very good planner. Um, it's it's drafting and redrafting. But the the boots, the riding boots. So they're um, they're Edith's brother's old riding boots, which have just been left in the boot cupboard, and. An IRA flying column uh, is in Drashan looking for weapons, looking for money, uh, which and the family obviously have to cooperate as much as they can because they don't want the house to be burned. It's all about being nice to people who are there with evil intent in your house, really, you know, to not to be taking umbrage. So Edith is trying to befriend one of the younger men in the flying column and she gives him she notices that you know he's hobbling with uh, boots that don't fit him, and she gives him an old pair of boots from the cupboard which belonged to her brother. And he stupidly does leave, as Colm says, his old old boots. And the reason I put those boots in was because I visited Drishan House where Edith uh, grew up, lived for most of her life, and there's a little museum there. And I noticed a pair of riding boots, women's boots, not men's, but I was very struck by them. Uh, objects matter a lot to me when I'm imagining work. It helps bring work to life for me. Clothes or houses or even just the view that someone would have seen. And those boots just struck me. I mean, there were other objects in the museum I could have latched on to. There was a portable easel for sketching outdoors, there was a ginormous sun hat out to there, there were examples of her artwork, there was a painting of her that a famous artist had done where she not liked the way he'd done her nose and mouth and had gone in and redone it. Um, and But the boots, the boots to me spoke of class difference, I think that was it. Even though Edith and her family thought they were on their uppers, and you know, compared with what they had been, there was less money. The biggest change in Irish life wasn't 1916, wasn't the War of Independence, 1919 to 1922. What changed Irish life was the Land War and the Land Acts, where the land is being 
passed over to the tenant farmers. And people had a little bit more money um, in the country people. The big houses no longer had rents. You know, that's why Edith's brothers were all off in the army and the navy, all off eventually becoming colonels and admirals. They had to go out to work, whereas once the rents would have allowed them to lead a gentleman squire kind of life. But these boots, to me, represented what those families had been and still were to a certain extent because they were handmade expensive boots which were still pretty good but could be left behind compared with the IRA flying column who came in and either had no boots at all or had ones that didn't fit them and so I put them in in the first draft and then the boots just growed and growed, and that was drafting, drafting. And was it? Yeah. I didn't yeah. actually know about four different yeah. movements of those yeah. boots until you'd said it to me. Yeah, there's another moment um, that I really love in the book where, um, you know, you're dramatizing the raid. So, so suddenly the IRA are coming looking for things. Now, what you do is you make the IRA people very different from each other. So there's a sort of thuggish one, there's a bully, there's a young guy who seems more innocent. They're, they're all behaving in a very different way. There's a beautiful moment later where one of them is asleep on the kitchen table and think, yes, but he's got a finger on a trigger, you know, so you've got to watch him. But, but as you're doing this and you have an argument going on over who's Irish, who's not Irish, who's rich, who's poor. Um, and, um, and then um, Edith says about her books to one of them, we wrote as we found my partner in me. And then the answer is, I dare say, but what you thought you saw and what was there before your eyes mightn't be one and the same. Your Ireland is a playground. And he goes on. It's a, it's a sort of rant against Anglo-Irish, against hunting, against all that. And then they continue talking about the land. And then you just watch this paragraph where you have her, because she's in the room. Everything is strange. It's the middle of the night. And one of the things that's happened is the servants have come down and she's never seen them before in their, with their hair down. Of course, this is as big for, like, she's, you know, she's noticing every single thing. Edith's eyes dark. She's never glimpsed either woman with her hair exposed. These are her servants. They've, although they've shared a roof for years, somehow it strikes her as more shocking than having a kitchen full of armed men. And it's a beautiful moment because she goes, it must have been the strangest idea. And I just love the idea of this small detail, a tiny thing coming in, domestic not large political, not an argument about Ireland, but a sudden business of a woman noticing her servants for the first time almost, as, as, as a constant, I think, tension in the novel between the intimate, between you know, the horses being used by the IRA, for example, or the horses as, as animals that she has very close to, the whole idea of her private life versus the public world going on. And, and so that battle then, has to be worked out in the book. In other words, if it is just to be a novel about an Anglo-Irish woman under pressure to, to preserve her house during the Anglo-Irish War, or later be, became called the War of Independence, then it, it, in, in a way it confines her to being a sort of victim of history or to being an ironic presence in an historical pageant. But what you do then is you, you give her, first of all, she's much more interested at a certain moment, she's written a play. And like any novelist who's ever dreamed of writing a play, you're always in trouble because people, playwrights, don't rate you. They think you should go back to the day job. <laughs> and so, you know, the whole idea that she's a relative of George Bernard Shaw's. And so her aim, when she writes the play, of course, it helps the novel enormous, enormously. It opens a space because it gives her a reason to travel. And that idea in these years of um, having to have reasons to go to London Lady Gregory, for example, um, invented the lane pictures. Her, you know, her nephew had a codicil to his will, which was mistaken. The painting should have gone to Ireland. They went to England. Lady Gregory had a wonderful new job in her life, which was to go to London constantly and meet the Prime Minister, the Minister for Culture, the National Gallery. She was on a mission in London. And so too, Edith has a mission now, which is her play. And this gives you the chance to have her in London but have her also a set scene with George Bernard Shaw 
And uh, I think George Bernard Shaw is really wonderfully imagined in the book, as is S.O. Smith, by the way, I mean, the craziness of her and the ambition and how forthright she was. But the George Bernard Shaw, is, is, I think it's a much more delicate portrait of, of him as, as a, an immensely sympathetic, interesting figure, as was his wife. But his wife bores Edith. There's a wonderful <laughs> moment where she just feels that when George Bernard Shaw leaves the room, all the oxygen has gone out of the room. The two women are sort of sitting there. The sort of glory has departed. So I just wonder if you could give us a sense of, like, in, in structuring the book, I think you had to put quite a lot of thought into how to get her out of a mere historical dilemma, how to give her a sort of destiny and a chance in life that was outside the, 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 you know, the mere business of, of, of being caught in this war. Well, I didn't want to set it entirely in Ireland um, in and, and you know the first half of the book is in really Castle Town's end with the odd little jaunt into Skibberina a few miles away. So it is this insular world. They're not travelling much because of the War of Independence. It's just coming up to the treaty, the Anglo-Irish Treaty. Um, they're wondering is war over now? Will we get back to normal? While knowing they'll never get back to normal because the world has changed. And I wanted to move her out from that to London. But as well, you're keeping an eye on the facts of her life, you know, the what of where she was. And I suppose what I was then trying to do is dip in between the what's to look at the why. So I knew the what was that she had gone to London around then. I might have jiggled with by a month or two, but that general time frame why was she in London? And then the broader canvas and the, this group of people that she moved among in London, she was very connected. And one of the interesting things about her is when she was living at Trashan, she was quite happy to interact with the neighbours and enjoyed the locals, um, didn't like the middle classes, they called them suburbans, felt quite threatened by the coming class because they were the ones buying the land that could no longer, you know, that they needed to sell to keep things going. Um, but liked the country people, liked their colourful language and quirky ways. And then she's in London and she's meeting lords and ladies family members, and Shaw. Shaw was married to a kind of a cousin of hers, and again... She was very rich, wasn't she? Her cousin, yes, yeah, yeah. yes, Charlotte Payne Townsend. She, was, um, she and her sister, Sissy, were the heiresses of County Cork, and it was very foolish of Edith's uh, brother, Cameron, who was the master of Trishan, not to pitch for her and try and marry her, because his one job was to marry an heiress to keep... Drashan going, but he didn't marry. Um, obviously, didn't want to, and that was fine too. But it was his role, you know. Um, but George Bernard Shaw got in there then. George Bernard Shaw got in, but later, you know, by that stage, Charlotte was looking for a husband and was a little bit older, and friends brought them together. And Shaw was regarded as a great man. He was, and at that time, sometimes friends would say, you know, a woman of property who will look after you and give you a steady home life while you produce your works of genius, um, make sure you eat regularly and so forth. And, and that was her role, really. She got a bit frustrated with it, I think, eventually, and um, took a shine to D.H. Lawrence, who used to visit and had a total That must have been her. fun. <laughs> yeah, I don't think D.H. Lawrence was interested in her, but she was certainly interested in him. Yeah, yeah. And um, But sure, I went to Iot St. Lawrence in Hertfordshire, which is this lovely Norman village there, and visited the house. You know, the, it's run by volunteers. It's lovely. It's exactly as they lived there. Uh, I was walking around with, with on a guided tour, and I spotted one of Edith's paintings uh, hanging in the parlour. And I went, "Oh, oh, that's Edith Somerville!" But nobody knew who she was. She's not so well known in England, and uh, but it was very distinctively her artwork. And um, I, just seeing the objects again helped me to vivify 
Sure, because I saw weighing scales all over the place. <laughs> As, and then I read up on it, and he was obsessed with weighing himself the whole time so that he wouldn't put on an ounce. And he had just lo lots of little objects everywhere. It, it was just very interesting. And then I discovered, I mean, people were still talking about it in Ayotz and Lawrence, that he was the most shockingly bad driver. And although he... Um, uh, employed a chauffeur, he'd love to take the wheel himself and he would just be a danger going through the village. But I came across one of those little details that bring people to life because you've got to be very careful not to caricature people like that and it would be very easy to caricature them. Um, I discovered that he was in the back of, no, he was in the front, he always travelled in the front, he was egalitarian and uh, he noticed the chauffeur just give a tiny, tiny little wave to a woman and child who were standing in the pouring rain by a bus stop. It was just a tiny little movement of his hand and Shaw said, who are they? And the chauffeur said, it's my wife and child. And Shaw made him turn the car around and give a lift in the pouring rain to um, this man, Fred Day's wife and daughter. And I thought that that was a telling detail about Shaw, who I imagine was a nightmare to live with in many, many ways, but was a humanitarian. Did he really have that um, work room that went... Mm -hmm. Just mm -hmm. describe it. It's the most wonderful writing shed. Is it still there? Yes, uh -huh. it is. Yeah, and you can hop in, and it's on a kind of an axis, a wooden, uh, kind of a wooden wheel, and he moves it around to follow the sun. Yeah. It's at the bottom of the garden, and there's a little day bed in there. He was a great believer in taking naps, yeah. so um, he would have a, a snooze there. And there were vegetarians and teetotalers and. Mm -hmm. Charlotte was fond of chocolates. Um, I think that was her big thing. But visitors used to sigh heavily because they'd be getting vegetarian food for the meals at a time when people believed it wasn't a meal unless you had a great big wallop of meat. Um, and they also, I mean, they were really ahead of their time, that couple. They, um, a lot of their back garden, they grew vegetables and they wanted to eat the vegetables that they grew. So it wasn't so common within their set. Uh, I, I found Shaw just so beguiling, and I went and read his plays again. Uh, he's writing St. Joan at this time. He's writing St. Joan at uh, that um, time. I had a teacher I don't know, who wasn't really a Republican, you know, but he took the view that of all the things that the, were, ever, were done during this period, there were, you know, between, you know, was the shooting of Sir Henry Wilson was the most marvellous thing, he said, and that, uh, uh, you see, it happened after the treaty was signed. So as though there was one more thing that they had forgotten to do in the time when they could was to shoot Henry Wilson. And they shot him after the treaty was signed. I should say the reason was that he seems to have signed the death warrant of Kevin Barry. You know, in other words, he was running out. Look, I have no idea whether this is true or not, but this is the teacher said that he was, he signed all those death warrants in the War of Independence. He was a tyrant in Ireland and he deserved to be shot. I have, I have no view on this. I'm completely neutral on the matter of Henry Wilson, except that I was in Liverpool, Liverpool Street Station one day. I was a huge monument to the, to the hero, Henry Wilson. So it just shows you, you move between the two islands and then the strangest Different differences views. occur. So, so tell us about Henry Wilson. Oh, well, just before I do, when you say that about the different views, I was, um, f for reasons I can't quite remember, I was at a dinner in the British Embassy. Uh, the, um, the British Irish, I might have the name slightly wrong, but one of the House of Commons committees, the British Irish one, um, were having a meeting in Belfast and then there was a dinner in Dublin and I was put beside an MP and the clerk of the uh, committee and I turned to the clerk of the committee and um, was speaking to him for a moment and he said to me, do you know who the greatest ever Englishman was? And I said, tell me. And he said, Cromwell. 
Charming. And I said, you might get a different view on that here. And he said, no, no. And he went off on it. So, I mean, just had no idea where he was or what the response would be. And then I turned to the MP on the other side of me and uh, said, what interests you in Irish affairs? And he said, oh, God, nothing. I'm hoping for a better committee if I do well on this one. <laughs> so, you know, difference. But just to get back to your question, Sir Henry Wilson, he was um, quite a dramatic figure. He had a scar on his face that looked like it was a sabre cut. He was a brigadier as well as Sir Henry Wilson. He had been the most senior army officer during World War I, I think. And um, he was Irish. He was born in Ireland. Perhaps he would have considered himself English, but he was born and grew up in an estate in Ireland and had pushed very, very hard for conscription to be extended during World War I. Uh, so that would be another strike against him. And yes, death warrants. He'd also um, just been elected as an MP and he was moving into a political career and he does seem to have been hated. And he was assassinated in June 1922 after the signing of the Anglo-Irish Treaty. And that seems to have precipitated the Civil War because um, the British cabinet then said to Michael Collins, put schmocked on your own people or uh, we'll do something about it. And the killing of Sir Henry Wilson seems to have been done with Michael Collins say so, but there is dispute as to whether he had just forgotten to stand down the men, so he had Put, uh, put out a, what would you call it, when someone is ordered to be... A fatwa? A, something like that. He'd put out, um, you know, he'd, he'd, he'd identified Sir Henry Wilson as a target. Two English men who had served in World War I, but were of Irish heritage, so regarded themselves as Irish. You know, they were. I'm not... I'm not being purist about it, but I'm, I do think it's interesting that they grew up in England and fought in the British Army, and they undertook this commission and did kill him. And one of them was very lame um, in, from the trenches, had a bad wound, and in fact that's how they were caught, because his friend Dunn, I think was his friend, uh, doubled back. He couldn't escape. They hadn't a very good escape route, and they killed... Brigadier Sir Henry Wilson on his doorstep. He jumped out of a taxi. He'd been doing an event, as you say, in Liverpool Street Station, got out of his t taxi, was in full regimentals, and they shot him on his doorstep and then tried to get away. And one of them was lame from a wound in the trenches, and his friend came back yeah. for him. And they were surrounded by the crowd then and held and uh, executed. They were hanged. Uh what, what's, what's fascinating about you, what, what you're saying there is the scene of you at this um, embassy dinner between these two <laughs> gents, yeah. and that suddenly Edith, you know, that in other words, the research you're doing is in fact what happened to you the day before. Yes, you're giving to Edith <laughs> the next day. I, I, isn't that right? That's what happens. Yeah, then, in other words, it? that Edith is sitting at a dinner. And she turns to the man to her left, and he is Sir Henry Wilson. And he has nothing good to say about anything. I mean, the, he doesn't like plays. He doesn't like music. He, he doesn't like art. He likes Ireland. actresses, though. <laughs> he likes actresses, you're right. Uh, but that, but that in, in other words, that you are actually finding things that are happening to you. It's what, it's well, what yeah, we it's, do, it's, it's what we do, it? yeah. But it's, but, it's, but it's interesting, because it's another aspect of a novel like this, where you're researching, you're going to the archive, you're imagining, but then you're also able to use things that are happening to you? Well, you have to, because otherwise it's too academic, isn't it? It's too dry as dust. So you're trying to puff emotional air then into these historical characters you've come across. And you have to take your own life and use what you can from your own life. Uh, I mean, I had to become Edith Somerville. Uh, I had to imagine what it would be like 
to be the mistress of a big house, even though, knowing my family history, I would have been the scullery maid. <laughs> uh, but she'd have chatted to me. She'd have picked my brain for stories and sayings. You know, she, she did like the servants. I don't mean that in a condescending way. She did genuinely enjoy them. Um, so, yeah, you're just imagining yourself into them and emotional reactions. Yeah. And are there other times where you're playing a game with people who have read the novels? For example, if you've read The Real Charlotte, The Real Charlotte, the, the, the way the animals are treated in the book, they're, they're given sometimes more life than the human beings are. You know, the, um, all the dogs and all the, the hens even get a big look in. And I'm thinking about the way in which the horses and especially the dogs in your book actually take their bearings from that, that she really does put a huge amount of emotional interest. Well, she loved her animals and I have a cat. I love my cat. My cat is called Chekhov. Um, I, if you have no children, I have no children, Edith had no children, you love your nieces and nephews, you love your friends, you love your pets. And they do become more important to you. You have that space. You know, love loves to love love. And But as well, I did notice that within her group, horses and dogs were very, very important. And she had a whole succession of dogs. And okay, I read that they mattered to her, but I also knew that they mattered to her because I was able to read her letters in the archive and her manuscripts and her uh, various iterations of a play she attempted to write about the Irish RM, Fleury's Wedding. And there are doodles of little dogs on them and you can see that she loved them. Um, she always had female dogs actually, but in fact I gave her a little male dog for various reasons. And the dog I called, although it wasn't one of the real names, the dogs were called things like Candy and so forth. I called it um, the little dog Dooley and I did an event in um, a lovely big house about a month ago and I sat beside a professor who's written, he was also being interviewed, a professor called uh, well, I won't tell you what it was called yet. Uh, I sat beside him. He's written a book about burning the big house and looking at how many big houses were burned at that time. He said about 300 out of 4,500. Um, he turned to me and he said, why did you kill a dog and give it my name? And I was looking at him thinking, well, I, nobody told me your second name. And then the penny dropped and his name was Professor Terence Dooley. <laughs> So, Finally, could you give us an account, just briefly, of what happened to the house after the book? Trishan. Yep, so Trishan is a lovely big house. It's not a ginormous one, you know, it's kind of a manageable size big house. It's at the mouth of Castle Town's End. You can't come in or out of the village without passing Trishan. It was built in the 1700s and... Um, by, uh, they call him Tom the Merchant. All the Somervilles tend to be called Tom, or at least one of the sons. Tom the Merchant made a lot of money and built this house. And um, the current owner is also Tom, and his eldest son is Tom. And the house... There's Somerville still. Somervilles are still living in that house. Thank you for picking me up on that. That house stayed in Somerville hands because Edith determined that it should be so. She poured her money from her um, literary work and she made a lot of money in her day. You know, she was critically and commercially successful. Um, she, poured, she bought houses with the money she earned and rented them out, so that was another revenue stream. Money went into Trishan. She was determined that it would stay, and she was determined that some of us would continue to live there. And she, she nagged her brothers that, you know, they had moved away, bar Cameron, and she was always very anxious that the next generation, if they weren't brought up in Trishan, wouldn't love it the way she and her brothers did. Um, but what struck me most is that she was determined to be a Chatelaine and do her best by this house which she would never, ever, ever inherit as a daughter. There were two girls and five boys. She was the eldest 
in the family. But she took it as a kind of a sacred trust. And Drashan represented Ireland to her and the broader area, the kind of Castle Townsend area, West Cork. She always described herself as, you know, coming from this particular barony and she was very specific about where she came from and was insistently Irish when she was in England and in fact would write kind of pitying letters um, about English manners and so forth and what they could learn from she, she regarded herself as Anglo-Irish, you know, from this ascendancy class. But as time evolved, she became more and more <coughs> determinedly Irish and wanted the family to stay there at a time when neighbours were selling up and going to the north or going to England, just felt there was no place in Ireland for them. This new Irish state that they saw was about to come into being thought, well, we won't be wanted here. We won't be able to make a contribution here. Edith kept saying, we will stay, we will live in Trishan, and we will make a contribution. You know, this new state will need gentlemen and ladies, as she saw it, but will need our skills. And it came about, really, I think, because of that determination. And Trishan is lived in today by Somervilles because of her. Martina Darren, thank you. Thank you very much.